Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Diana Lowe about emotional intelligence and developing future leaders. Diana Lowe, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. It is a pleasure to be with you today. You're joining us from the Phoenix area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about the importance of emotional intelligence in developing future leaders. Now, there are so many different components to effective leadership. And I I don't want to suggest emotional intelligence is the only important aspect. It certainly isn't. But among all of the array, the wide array of different characteristics and capabilities Uh, I would say one of the most universal across settings that's important is emotional intelligence. And especially in this day and age with hyper competitive workplaces, rapid Mm -hmm. pace of change, disruptive innovations, just the messiness and the complexities and the uncertainty in the world around us, more than ever, we need people leading organizations and teams that really have a heightened level and sense of emotional intelligence about them if they're going to be able to be up to the challenge uh, of leading in this kind of uh, a modern context. So this is what we're going to be discussing together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Diana's bio with everybody. Diana Lowe is the CEO of Blue Light Leadership, a leadership development company focused on educating, training, and coaching emotional intelligence for remote leaders. Blue Light helps companies keep their top talent in this new remote and hybrid work environment in this war on talent. She works with directors and senior executives in Fortune 500 companies to transform their team spirit and communication, turning low-performing teams to highly productive and engaging teams. Her practice focuses on using evidence-based research in positive psychology for coaching, which allows her a whole-person wellness approach in coaching. Blue Light is a woman and minority-owned business, and Diana calls Phoenix, Arizona her home. When she's not playing with her two little girls or hanging out with her hubby, you can see her on stage doing stand-up comedy. And if you are wondering, no, she is not that funny. That is what it says in her bio, but I think you are funny. I think that's incredible that you are you do stand-up comedy and uh, also sounds like you have a beautiful family, uh, really just all the way around. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm excited to have this conversation. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Well, I'm a global person, so I think this conversation will come from a global mindset. I'm Puerto Rican, born and raised, but my husband's British. I have my British passport, and I've traveled and worked around the world, so I come to every conversation with a really global perspective. Um, I think that's the only thing that I would share. I liked, I aspire to be a global person with a global mindset as well. I've done a fair amount of traveling, a fair amount of working in other countries and living in other countries. Um, you know, I, I suppose it's all relative and, and uh, it's not a competition of who's been more global, but the reality is I find, you know, it's just so easy to kind of get into your groove and to get comfortable with where you're at and with your surroundings. And very quickly you can start to forget you know, e- even if you have a lot of those international experiences, it's very easy to fall into the trap of forgetting, um, yep. you know, that people around the world have completely different viewpoints, completely different yeah. ways of understanding the world. Um, and, and we kind of just get cut up in our own media 
bubble here and 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 we you know we just reinforce those same narratives over and over again it's really really That's helpful true. and it's essential and important that we get out of that and that we can understand um you know it's, it's one of the reasons why diversity in organizations is just so important we need to pull that in as much as possible if we hope to to attract and retain good people from across the world if we hope to resonate with customers from across the world we we definitely need to have that kind of global mindset so i appreciate you um, laying that out there too as we start this conversation all right so i know you have a ton of background and experience obviously in emotional intelligence it's a, it's at the heart of what you do in your work with your firm tell us a little bit about what emotional intelligence means to you uh, you know, I, the term gets thrown around all the time, and I think some people just use it because it's kind of a catchy, you know, it's it's a modern uh, cliche phrase, totally. and, and and so people feel like they need to say it. Other people really do understand it. Tell me what it kind of uh, how how you understand it and why you feel it's important in the modern workplace. Yeah, absolutely. M- emotional intelligence gets thrown around like you said. And I think most people understand the word emotional and they understand intelligent. Most people, I would say, think they are intelligent. So, and they know they have emotions. So most people tell me, oh, I'm already really emotionally intelligent. And that is true because adults have that skill. However, emotional intelligence is really, for me, it's a set of skills that we use to identify our own emotions and then use that information, not to project our emotions, but to understand how to make better decisions in the moment based on what we're feeling and observe and using our, our powers of observation for what other people are feeling. So when we're not connected to our emotions, we can't really make the best decisions for what, what is actually happening. And I, I often think of it as like having blinders on. If we are blind to the emotional information, in our environment, we can make really bad decisions. And I see this time and time again with leaders, especially really driven leaders who are focused on tasks. And let's face it, we're the way that we are raised, we're not really raised to be in touch with our emotions. We're starting to get there. But it's like, you know, if you have pain, push it down and keep moving. So the work I'm doing is it's undoing some things and creating a lot of awareness around like, what is actually happening with us because we tend to push it down or keep busy to ignore it. So that's really how I see emotional intelligence. It's really a set of skills in order to emotionally regulate and make better decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And I I like how you just term that emotionally regulate. And we can only do that if Mm -hmm. we understand what we're feeling, how we're feeling it, why we're feeling it that way and how what we're feeling and what we're exuding impacts others around us. Right. And so it's just that self-awareness um, is, is so essential. And frankly, it's something that most people aren't very good at, <laughs> um, you know, because and, and, and not, not because we don't have good intentions or not because we don't try to practice self-reflection or mindfulness or, or whatever, but it's just, you know, it, we're, we're so hectic. We're so busy. We're running around constantly. So that's part of the problem. Another part of the problem is, you know, it, it takes some, a real kind of higher level of personal security um, and comfort with yourself to be mm-hmm. willing to look at yourself deeply in the mirror like that mm-hmm. uh, and, and everything that you're going to see. <laughs> and, and, and it's, it's one thing, you know, someone, someone says something to us, they give us some feedback and it kind of stings. It hurts. We get defensive, right? Um, emotions, emotions, emotions. That's what you just right. said. So like exactly. it stings, it hurts. And so we try to run from that because emotions are inconvenient, right? Yeah. They're negative. They're frustrating. They're like most people's vocabulary for negative or I don't like to think of them as negative or positive, but for they feelings just are, that yeah. make, yeah, they just are. And they have information uh-huh. and the information that they have. So emotions don't speak to us in words necessarily. It speaks to us in sensations. It speaks to us in, in pain or it will sit somewhere within our body. It'll sit way heavy on us, right? Yeah, yeah. And so if we don't understand or take time to decode that, then we just push it down. We keep moving. And one day it comes up as something else or it yeah. could manifest into some sort of disease or, you know, right. so I mean- 
I'm not yeah, a doctor, and, so. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. There's a clear connection between emotional health and physical health. And yeah, um, yeah if, if we tend to get defensive, if someone else, even, even the most neatly crafted constructive feedback, people tend to still get defensive over that. If we get defensive yeah. with that, how likely are we to look ourselves in the mirror and actually be truly self-reflective and, and, and even critical of, of what we see and, and what we're, how we're dealing with things. Right. It, it's just, I think there, there's, there's a, um, well, what's the phrase? I don't know. Like it's just hi- hardwired into our brains and our, our evolutionary psychology, you mm-hmm. know, to, to avoid pain. And, you know, when yeah. we have those hard feelings, we often interpret it as it's, it's not necessarily bad or good. It, it just is, but we often interpret it as pain to be avoided, yeah. to be pushed down, to be shut out. And then we can't deal with it. We can't learn from it. And, and we're, we, we become trapped by it, you know? So that's, it, yeah, I, it keeps us stuck. You're right. Yeah. It keeps our, our career plateauing. It creates like environments where things are not good because we're not really dealing with X, right? We're not dealing with this, this feeling. And sometimes when we name it specifically, that it, instead of saying like, I feel bad, if you say, I feel really jealous about this, that's an indication that you want something that somebody else has. So that might be a new goal, right? But jealousy isn't like something that we think like, oh, that's really good. To be jealous is great, but that can give us a deeper indication of where we need to be headed, what's important to us. Right. Well, you know, so there, it's really important. So this is the work that we have to do. And if everybody takes off one layer of our, like you said, that, that protectedness uh-huh, and just yeah. kind of discovers that one layer, we could be 1% better and that's better than no percent better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think people can recognize as we're talking, this is important for our own emotional, psychological, uh, and physical health, mm-hmm. but it's also really essential if we're going to be effective and impactful leaders. Uh, we've all been around leaders who are anything but, and um, it, it, it's strug- It's a struggle for everybody when you're in that kind of an environment, especially if there's a toxic leader. Um, so we need more emotionally intelligent, in tune um, leaders that can show empathy and, and gratitude and compassion towards their people in genuine ways. Check out my new book, The Future Leader, Creating and Transforming Next-Gen Organizations. Stemming from two decades of professional experience and over 600 in-depth interviews with executives, thought leaders, and scholars from across the globe, The Future Leader will help you explore the ordinary, everyday actions that will help you to prepare to lead in the future of work, to respond to an uncertain future, and to produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy. Courses, micro-credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro-credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award-winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro-credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. We need to be able to take this beyond just, yeah, it's good for me. 
to recognizing this is good for me. It's good for my team. It's good for my organization. If I'm in a leadership role, if I have responsibility for others, I need to model this for others. I need to support and promote this and encourage it in the lives of those that I lead and serve. Um, and, and I need to, to really, as I'm thinking about the needs of my people and I'm trying to help them prepare for future career opportunities to develop into their future leader, uh, into that future leader potential, this has to be a key component in that mix, I think. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that and how you, how, how can I, if I come to this realization that this is something important to me, I work on it within myself, um, first, I need to you know, become more in tune before I can really help anyone else to become more in tune. Um, as I start to do that, how can I then start to pay it forward and really help those in my team, in my organization to do the same so that they're prepared for future opportunities to lead and serve in the organization in their future? So it's interesting as you were talking about this, and we often hear like more empathy, more compassion. I think that scares certain energy types, certain people who are more analytical, people who are more facts-based, like facts and driven. I once worked worked with a double PhD and he told me that that like, he, he told me all the reasons he couldn't connect with people and that these things didn't work. And it was because his head, um, his head owned everything he did. Right. So he lacked that connection to his heart, not saying that he didn't have a heart, but he was just like, there was a barrier there, right? So when we let our head take over, then we hear words like empathy and compassion. We're like, oh, that makes us like tense up a little bit. And what's interesting is a dichotomy that I see currently working with leaders is that in our Western society, the people who get things done, I get things done, I get tasks, I win, I achieve, Those are the people who are typically more task driven, task focused, and they're not really worried about empathy and they're not rewarded for having empathy and they're not necessary. They don't need to be. There's no reason for them to be in touch with courage or passion. They they have it, but for other people, they have it for themselves and not for other people. So the paradigm shift that I think we're experiencing now and how everybody becomes more emotionally intelligent as we have to understand for our energy, what does more empathy mean? Like what does somebody who's completely analytical, who's, who's rewarded based on uh, understanding research and facts and data, what does being empathy mean to being empathetic mean or being sensitive to other people's feelings? Could it just be just a sentence that says, hey, John, I notice you're upset. Or is it a case of, we like, do we start rewarding people for having those behaviors? Because that's not what I'm seeing in corporate current, uh, current corporate America. So it's really interesting. I think how we engage it is we have to start our own. We can't expect other people to necessarily model it because they will model it for themselves. What emotional intelligence looks like for them. Right. And personally, I'm always going to say you need a coach. Obviously, would I like you to have me? Yes but I can't serve everybody. So just having, starting to break through that awareness and understanding like, what does this actually mean for me? Because emotional intelligence is tied to our creativity. It's tied to our innovation. It's tied to our conflict management, to our accurate self-assessment. And like, it's tied to lots of different skills that we can have, but we need to have that space for, for having that self-reflected. And this is something I've been working on. I'm still working on it. So I cannot say that I read this and I study this and I work with people, but I can't say I'm, I'm there. I think this is a lifelong process. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Nobody arrives at this um, because it's, it by the very definition, you know, and as we've been describing it, it's something that's, you have to continually strive to be in tune. And that only happens mm-hmm. as we kind of uh, exercise those muscles <laughs> and, and practice practice it and really recognize, I mean, we, and as, as in tune as you think you might, uh, not might be in this moment. Um, the second that we think that we haven't figured out is the, mo- is, is the, the instant that we need to take another step back and re-examine because, you know, 
that, that kind of, we just have to continually have intellectual humility and emotional humility around what we're doing and how we're interacting with those around us. You make a really important point about corporate America and about task oriented people. Um, certainly it doesn't need to be either, or like you can be a very productive task oriented, uh, person and still show a lot of empathy and compassion towards people. You can be both analytical, Absolutely. right? It, 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 it certainly, we, we can do more of this in, in tandem and combination. And that's what I would argue we need in future leaders. Cause do we need leaders who, who have that analytical mindset, who can understand data and look uh, dispassionately at problems and try to come up with solutions. Do we need that? Yes, absolutely. But do we also need leaders who can understand the full holistic picture, understand not only the business case, but the human case and the ethical considerations behind decisions? Absolutely we do. And so yeah. this emotional con- intelligence piece, is it going to look and manifest itself a little bit differently for every person? Yes. Um, can everyone foster this and develop it in themselves? Uh, I, I absolutely believe so. Even the most narcissistic, arrogant, you know, executive can learn this. They really truly can if they're willing to take those first steps to take that step back, uh, look at themselves in the mirror and, and address what they see and, and how they're processing the world around them. There can be transformations made in people and we need more of those transformations and we need to, to, to grow up and develop the next generation of leaders who you know, as I look at the younger generations, younger millennials and Gen Z, there's, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, really painting with a broad brush, broad brush strokes here, right? Stereotypes. But generally speaking, younger generations are very, very interested in and passionate about making a difference in the world, having Absolutely. an impact, doing work social that's impact. meaningful, social mm-hmm. impact, all those sorts of things. They're very, very passionate about all these things. The, all the ideas around emotional intelligence and empathy and social justice and just doing right by others, that's, that resonates very highly with younger people. Let's, let's tap into that, right? And, and prepare them, coach them, educate them, develop them into the next generation of leaders, just like we saw you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago predominant leadership style was much more authoritarian command control. We've, you know, there's still some of that, but we largely shifted in our overall leadership approach in most organizations. I think we can do that again. We can shift more moving into the future of work and we need to, I think if we're going to be successful and have healthy, safe organizations for employees. And you know, what's interesting about that, that I'm finding is that it's not just Gen Z, Gen Y, um, millennials that that need that purpose. In fact, I would say most of the people, baby boomers included, although they're you most of them are transitioning out of the workplace, but I would say most people I encounter, they need some sort of purpose. It almost doesn't matter what generation they're from. I suspect that people in the past needed that as well, but because it wasn't the topic of conversation, it wasn't like something that was accepted or I know my dad had this philosophy, you just hate your work and you just do it. But I suspect that even though he kept that um, societal philosophy, everybody kind of had that. Like it's called work for a reason, not play. He still needed a a purpose and a meaning. I think that's a, a human yearning, you know? And emotional intelligence, it's not something that's gonna go away. It's not, it might transform and look different in the future, but when we're working in such high pace, fast pace, people, technology can work that fast, but we still need time to reflect. We still, we can't work at those paces. So I think emotional intelligence just helps us really understand what we need as humans, you know, really understand that like, although I like this work and it's meaningful, it's killing me inside, right? Or maybe I didn't realize I actually don't like this work and I've been doing it because I've been living somebody else's dream. That's what I had. I, w- I started in finance. I did finance for a really long time, but somewhere in the middle of the nightmare, <laughs> I woke up and I was like, this is not my dream. Like, this is not my nightmare. Why am I living this? So I think eventually we all come around to, I need purpose. I need meaning. And 
you know, emotional intelligence, I think personally just helps us get there with that awareness, understanding what we need, you know, what we're feeling. Absolutely. Absolutely. I do a lot of, of research in this space. So I'll just double down on what you just uh, double down on what you just said that absolutely meaning and purpose is one of the key indicators and top drivers of engagement, satisfaction, uh, and, and otherwise motivating people, regardless of age cohort, regardless of, of, of their age. Um, so I think that is a really, really important point. Um, so let's, let's find ways to infuse our work, our organizations with more genuine meaning and purpose in, in terms of work design, in terms of the types of jobs that people do. Uh, let's, let's build more emotional intelligence into how we lead our people and let's develop the next generation of leaders to be perhaps just a little bit better <laughs> than we are at this. And I think, I think we can do it. Well, I think we Diana, can. it has just been a pleasure. I know at the time I have to let you go here in just a minute, but before we wrap up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yeah, sure. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm Diana Elo on LinkedIn. I also, you can um, connect with me other under Blue Light Leadership on LinkedIn. We have a company page. And also um, my website is uh, bluelightleadership.com. And you can go there, read a little bit more about what we do. And if you think you have a leader who is maybe a little insensitive or comes across as a little un- unempathetic, let's have a chat. Or maybe you feel like your career is plateauing and you need to Um, boost your own skills, that might be a good place to start. Wonderful. Thank you, Diana. It has been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Diana and her team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Bluer than indigo leadership the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace 
and personal life. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Subtle results, still you, but with fewer lines. Botox Cosmetic, out of botulinum toxin A, is a prescription medicine used to temporarily make moderate to severe frown lines, crow's feet, and forehead lines look better in adults. Effects of Botox Cosmetic may spread hours to weeks after injection, causing serious symptoms. Alert your doctor right away as difficulty swallowing, speaking, breathing, eye problems, or muscle weakness may be a sign of a life-threatening condition. Patients with these conditions before injection are at highest risk. Don't receive Botox Cosmetic if you have a skin infection. Side effects may include allergic reactions, injection site pain, headaches, eyebrow and eyelid drooping and eyelid swelling. Allergic reactions can include rash, welts, asthma symptoms, and dizziness. Tell your doctor about medical history, muscle or nerve conditions including ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, myasthenia gravis, or Lambert-Eaton syndrome and medications, including botulinum toxins, as these may increase the risk of serious side effects. For full safety information, visit BotoxCosmetic.com or call 877-351-0300. See for yourself at BotoxCosmetic.com.